Well, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. I'd like to welcome you all. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, potentially, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you our installment, the first installment of our 2018 webinar series on the topic of how cities are managing their transportation growing pains. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm president here at E4C, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and our YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on the slide you see in front of you. Information on upcoming webinars is also available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at the email listed on the slide. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about engineering for change. E4C is a knowledge organization and a global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities worldwide. Some of these challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, innovative infrastructure, and more. We invite you to become a member of E4C. Membership is free and provides access to news and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information and to sign up, please visit our website. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we'd like to practice using the WebEx platform, so I invite you to tell us where in the world you are. Using the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon on the top right corner. And I'll go ahead and get us started. Okay, so I see there's some folks here who are joining us from Florida, from San Diego, from Colorado, Australia, California, New York City, uh, Newburgh, Indiana, Ohio, all over the United States, and more. We're so excited to have you join us. Um, all right. Um, oh, Kazakhstan. This is the first time I've had someone join us from Kazakhstan. Welcome. How exciting. Um, all right. Very good. I see everyone's using it's 4 a.m. in the UK. Um, early good morning to you, for sure. So uh, we, we're excited to have you join us here today. If you don't see the chat window, again, a reminder, it, uh, there's a link at the top of the screen. During the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A window, which is below the chat, to type in your questions for our presenter. Again, if you don't see it, click the icon in the top right corner. That way we can keep track of all of our questions. Um, you can use the chat uh, to send any private um, messages to the Engineering for Change admin should you have any issues. Now, if you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. For those of you who are professional engineers, E4C webinars qualify you for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. The link is shown here on the slide. Now, let me move on to the next slide here. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar and our presenter. 
As you may be aware, rapidly growing cities and developing regions are experiencing unique challenges and opportunities for innovation in transportation and a more sustainable future for all. Today, we're very pleased to be joined by Darina Poyani, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland and co-author of the Urban Transport Crisis and Emerging Economies. Dr. Poyani will take us through select case studies and enlighten us to the urban issues, policies, and initiatives that are taking place in frontier markets. Dr. Poyani joined University of Queensland's planning program as a lecturer in 2015. She received tenure and was promoted to senior lecturer in 2017. Originally from Albania, she lived, worked, and uh, studied in Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands, and the U.S. prior to moving to Australia. In 2016 to 17, she was a visiting lecturer at the University of Vienna, Austria. Uh, her research interests encompass urban transport, urban design, and housing. She has published books and numerous articles on urban planning, and she's going to give us insights into her latest work on today's webinar. Thank you for joining us, uh, Darina, and I turn it over to you. Hi, hi, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. Um, I'll get started right away. Um, I'll be presenting today the findings from my latest book um, called The Urban Transport Crisis in Emerging Economies, which was just published last year um, by Springer. Uh, it, the book covers 12 of the major world economies in, um, in developing countries. Most of those are located in the global south, but not all of them. Uh, and if you look at the slide, it's the countries that are uh, marked in white color. Now, the inspiration from the book or the idea came from this observation that um, a lot of the cities of the global south or the developing world are looking more and more the same because of their uh, transportation system. So they've come to be dominated by congestion rather than traditional landmarks, such as, for example, monuments or plazas or squares. And here I have just, um, just a few examples. Now, another observation um, is that urban transport seems to, to be perverse in that it tends to become worse when cities get wealthier, while um, other policy areas like education or healthcare improve. And of course, an inefficient and polluting or the transport system affects um, households, individuals, businesses, the community at large. It has major effects on health and on the environment, but also on urban economies and social development and no less social inclusion. At the same time, urban transport is one of the keys to a more sustainable and human urban future in the 21st century. Um, so after this introduction, um, I'll talk a bit about the position itself. It will be structured according to strategies or interventions. Um, we have grouped those into, into nine categories. And this framework also comes from my prior work. Um, on the slide, it's listed on the right-hand the right -hand side, um, the article where this, um, this particular framework comes from. And to make it extra clear, um, the list of interventions is color-coded by least desirable towards most desirable interventions. So I'll start with this, the first one, investments in road construction. So these historically have been considered sort of the magic lens to resolve all manner of um, urban transport problems. So the predict and provide paradigm has been very present in the global south. The problem is that it has been shown both um, theoretically and empirically that the benefits of um, building new roads or um, increasing capacity of existing roads 
are um, are commonly offset by this phenomenon called induced demand. Um, increased road capacity commonly results in the diversion of travel from um, lower volume hours of the day, parallel commuting routes, or public transportation. And in a very short time, congestion levels are restored to almost pre extension levels. So there is this um, vicious circle at play. So some people will say that this type of approach, trying to resolve condition issues by expanding roads, is like trying to cure obesity by um, buying bigger pants. And it doesn't work. However, this continues to be a typical policy response um, in most of the countries that we covered in the book. Here is a picture from, from Ankara, an urban highway that became congested very soon after its completion. It was the picture was provided by the um, by the author of the of the Turkey chapter, uh, Ella um, Babalek. Uh, now the problem with this approach is not just that it's um, theoretically ineffective, but um, it also presents a social inclusion issue because the roads are mainly used by an elite minority that owns that owns cars. In developing countries, uh, we see a situation as different to, say, the United States or Australia, where the majority of people have cars. Um, we were talking about just a very um, top slice of the population owning cars, and Increasing road capacity also produces more and more urban sprawl as development tends to follow um, tends to follow roads. Now, the mentality among policymakers in emerging economies is changing, but um, not quickly enough. So there is we see more of a rhetorical change towards um, moving away from traditional road construction. Um, but the reality is that more money is put into roads than alternative modes. I'll talk about that um, next. Um, another area where a lot of money tends to be put or tends to be spent is parking, which also consumes um, large amounts of space in um, the cities of emerging economies. And some of those cities are only starting to realize uh, that parking, especially free parking, comes as a very high cost. Now I'll move on to um, the next area or the next strategy type investments in rail based transport. Um, I've, um, I wanted to cover first theoretically the two main types of rail based transport like rapid transit, LRT, or heavy rail or um, metro, metro transport. So LRT is present in the cities of developing countries, and it ranges from the conventional on-street tramways, such as the example of this Moscow tram presented on the, um, the picture on the left-hand side, um, and all the way to the elevated systems of places like, like Singapore. It tends to be present only in the wealthier cities of developing countries. It has, of course, lower construction costs than metros, um, and it positively impacts air quality in the cities where it is present because it runs on, um, on electricity as opposed to petrol, um, like buses. Generally, cities that build LRT signal this more permanent commitment to public transport. So it's desirable um, in the sense of in the sense of image. But then when it comes to operations, if LRT operates simply at grade without much priority um, from other traffic, it really has not a major operational advantage compared to, to busways. And I'll talk about busways um, in another slide. Um, then we have the case of heavy rail, metro. Um, I've uh, put up a picture, an example from Delhi's metro on the, the right-hand side. 
Now, the problem with Metro is that it requires cost segregation from other traffic because it's fed electricity from an electrified third rail. So, therefore, because it needs to be segregated, construction costs um, are the highest. Although, so the capacity is the highest because full segregation means that metros do not have to stop at traffic lights. There, there are no impediments on the way. Um, so, capital cost um, estimates vary um, from perhaps 8 million per kilometer for at grade kind of metros. Um, if one can secure the right of way on the surface. Uh, but then cost escalates all the way to 150 million per kilometer for difficult terrain. And in fact, an already built up city that has major underground infrastructure can be considered difficult terrain because a lot of sewer lines and water lines would have to be displaced to accommodate metro systems. So that's in short the theory. Now, now let's move on to the practice. The reality is that only developing cities with a population of more than two or three million, places like Mexico City or Delhi, this is from the uh, example in the picture, have in place metro systems. Most other cities just simply can't afford them. They're too they're too expensive. Uh, one exception is Chinese cities. China has been building um, a huge amount of um, rail transport, urban rail transport, since since 1990, um, and it's been aided, of course, by its strong economy during this period. There is this great um, GIS graphic which you can access through this link that I posted at the bottom of the slide. I've extracted um, the images of rail construction in three three periods, 1990, 2000, and 2020. It shows the um, huge growth in urban rail in China. But otherwise, if you can look at the, at the GIS for a more gradual growth to see, the, to see the evolution. Now, let's move on to um, another type of intervention, the promise of future technologies. And I'm covering only three. Of course, technology is just one word, but it encompasses quite a lot. Um, so I'll cover um, biofuels, electric cars, and now the new, um, the new invention, self-driving cars. So biofuels are, of course, less polluting at the point of view than conventional fuels. But um, when it comes to developing countries, the deployment of developing countries, the concern is that a lot of agricultural land might be um, used to produce biofuels for domestic use and for export. And then as a consequence, um, countries that um, adopt biofuel production in a major way might suffer food shortages. So that's, that's one concern. Uh, electric cars, another type of another type of intervention. The problem here is that the pollution, yes, is lower at the point of use, um, but we need to look at the pollution during the whole lifetime of the car. So from the moment it's produced in a factory to the moment it's brought to the market, and then um, we also need to look at the afterlife of an electric car and. Um, I've put here this pile of discarded batteries of electric cars. Um, and this is a scenario that happens quite commonly in developing countries that do not have the facilities to recycle used batteries. So um, people who have crunched the numbers um, will say that the overall pollution might not be, might not be a lot less than conventional cars. And then we have um, the case of self-driving cars. It's perhaps too early to talk about their deployment in developing countries. Um, so I'll only talk about this briefly. One concern is that um, with, with self-driving cars, um, 
we are looking forward to a future where robots will be making these moral decisions about um, what to do in the case of a potential accident. And if you'd like to um, look at a series of scenarios that present this moral dilemma that cannot be easily resolved by science, they're more philosophical questions, you can click on this, um, on this link, moral machine at mit.edu, um, and there you can see this more human perspective on moral decisions made by self-driving cars, and you can also test yourself, see what, what you would do if you're faced with um, a dilemma in traffic and it involves a self-driving car. Okay, so these are um, the main theoretical points I wanted to make regarding technology. Um, but now what's the reality in emerging economies? What were the findings from the book? Well, it looks like um, technology is still too expensive for, for emerging economies. And um, a lot of the benefits um, at this point in time may be offset by rapid authorization. Also, we need to keep in mind that technological solutions cannot be some sort of panacea for urban transport problems. Um, in fact, things like congestion cannot be solved by technology. Yes, the biofuels, electric cars, maybe they'll um, help with solution, but um, they don't necessarily fix our cities. So behavioral change will be required to resolve a lot of these problems, and I'll talk about that more next. So the reality at this moment in time is that um, developing cities have been adopting the more inexpensive types of technologies in urban transport, so new mobility services by cell phone or on-demand parking payments, and um, there are versions of um, Uber that are very specific to, to certain cities like Grab Bike, um, like in the picture here from Jakarta in Indonesia, or Didi Taxi, that's the Chinese version of, um, of Uber. Um, there is some experimentation in different places with intelligent transport systems uh, for traffic, general traffic management. And then um, in the case of India, there is this major mission to create um, 100 smart cities in the country, uh, which will employ technology in a major way. But many experts are quite skeptical. They'll say that it's more political propaganda than um, a feasible kind of, kind of project. So generally, uh, turning over the existing fleet of polluting vehicles has proven difficult. And that, um, that's one of the big priorities um, in the countries that we reviewed in the book. Okay, another, um, another type of intervention are um, pricing mechanisms, which charge the price to access a certain area of the city, typically the downtown area, like the example of Gordon pricing applied in Tehran, Iran. That's, uh, that's what the illustration on the slide shows. Um, Overall, um, the research in the book shows that there has been great political reluctance to introduce measures that curtail the use of cars and motorcycles. Um, and even when benefits are accrued by um, congestion charging areas like the one in Tehran, these tend to be offset by the growing levels of motorization um, in developing cities. Uh, we see experimentation with pricing and taxation schemes, but sometimes even these have been counterproductive. For example, in India, buses are taxed more than personal vehicles. Um, and then I need to say that these types of schemes, they might have an effect, but it's only in a limited in a limited area, they don't have um, very large overall effects that cover, that cover the whole city. Um, another category of intervention um, are vehicle access restrictions. Um, and 
developing cities has been experimenting with these, but with limited success. Um, one relatively successful scheme is the Oino Circular scheme in, um, implemented in Mexico City, which uh, prohibits cars from circulating one day a week um, based on um, license plate numbers. Uh, it has backfired to some extent um, when it was initially introduced because some people purchase second and third cars to, um, to game the system. Overall, the, the, the effect has been, has been positive. Um, then China is another country that um, has been trying to restrict private vehicle ownership by limiting the um, issuing of license plates. Um, but overall, it's been difficult to to restrict vehicle access. That's a general finding um, from the book. Another category is the strengthening of land use control. And of course, this is not a transport intervention as such, but land use and transport have a very strong relationship. One cannot have a very efficient public transport system in very low density sprawling kind of environments like the one here illustrated in the slide in Cape Town um, in South Africa. In these kind of environments, of course, private vehicles play the major role for, for moving people around. Uh, some other characteristics of um, land use in, in emerging economies that then affect systems are these um, very dynamic urban development processes, mostly led by the private sector rather than by the government, very high construction levels in some cities to meet housing demand, but we also see increasing social polarization and segregation as countries um, grow wealthier. Uh, we haven't seen uh, equal distribution of that wealth. Uh, but rather just polarization at the extremes. And of course, that kind of polarization has spatial effects. We see uh, more and more gated communities for the rich and the middle class who tend to cut themselves off from the rest of society. And spatial, this type of spatial inequalities, um, I feel they're perfectly illustrated in this picture from, from Sao Paulo that has made around of the internet where we see side to side one high rise, very fancy development for the wealthy right next door to a uh, poor favela. Now, developing cities are slowly recognizing that they need to adopt better land use policies that encourage the use of public transport. But there is a big gap between rhetoric and practice. Um, another category of intervention is um, simply awareness raising campaigns. And these can be um, quite low cost, have been taking place in many, many countries. One type of campaign is the World Car Free Day that's celebrated in many countries on um, September 22nd every year. Uh, however, the success in reversing travel habits has been has been minimal. So many specialists at this point are saying that perhaps the focus should should shift from awareness raising campaigns for the population at large to professional training and education. And this has also proven difficult to do because a lot of countries in emerging economies, with emerging economies, they suffer from, from brain drain. So they're better trained professionals. They move to, to the global north. And this phenomenon is partly responsible for the lack of reform. Um, now, one exception um, is India, where um, these um, centers of excellence in urban transport are being created that will um, provide financial assistance for professional training. And the effect remain, remains to be seen. They're still relatively new. Um, 
one type of intervention that is paramount, and you can see from the um, green color of the title in the slide, um, is road-based public transport. And I've distinguished this from rail-based public transport. Um, is more desirable, uh, mainly because, because of its lower cost. So road-based public transport obviously includes conventional buses. Um, those do not tend to um, do much for the image of public transport in, in various countries. But proportionately now, there is this uh, higher level um, public transport system as rapid transit, which promises to deliver benefits that are similar to rail, but at much at much lower cost. And let me give you some basic information on um, BRT. So BRT has been has been developed all over the world. Um, it started in Latin America, but um, but it's spread now to Asia, and it's one type of intervention that um, was initially invented in the in the global south, and then it was exported into the global north. Uh, usually, the direction of policy trends goes the other way around, so um, BRT is special in in that way. And at this point, there's been plenty of research on BRT operations. There is strong evidence that um, these systems are appealing and effective. Uh, the landmark system is still, um, or the two landmark systems are still in Latin America, so Curitiba and Bogota, BRT systems and recipients. In Asia, the largest system is in Guangzhou in, in China. Um, so this is for the positive side, but of course BRT is not a miracle cure either. So and some BRTs, of course, have been more um, or less successful. Um, it is a very complex type of transport planning, and some systems have suffered from fragmented planning or operational inefficiencies, political struggles during their design and then later implementation. Um, land acquisition can be a problem when designing a system in an already built city. Um, there have been issues with cost overruns, although the system is more cost effective than rail, like I said. And in some cases, um, there has been this interaction with social equality issues, um, because BRT sometimes is also seen as a way to um, rehabilitate informal settlements, and so the interplay with social issues varies from, from country to country. There, Unfortunately, there have been a few cases of BRTs that were built and are already dismantled, like the case in, um, in Delhi. And we've also seen that in some countries, because the systems are higher quality than conventional buses or uh, paratransit, informal transit, um, then the fares are also too high for, for the urban poor. So these are some of the issues to, to keep in mind when thinking, when thinking of the IT. And then finally, um, support for non-motorized modes, uh, one cannot stress enough how important non-motorized transport is to cities. And when we talk about a non-motorized transport, it's not just about having a sidewalk or having a bicycle lane, but it's also about the general feel of cities. For example, a city like the Chinese city here in this example with this major highway that runs um, across the urban space cannot be considered a pedestrian friendly environment. This city is obviously dedicated to cars. So it's also um, a visual perception, not just um, about the practicalities of providing unmotorized infrastructure. Now, in the book, we found through, um, through the chapters that our authors wrote, we found that very few cities are currently
aren't inventing any substantial amounts in cycling and walking infrastructure. That's very unfortunate. So a walking revolution in particular is not forthcoming. And wherever there are positive interventions um, in walking and cycling, cycling paths, this tends to be in small pockets or disconnected corridors. And cycling in particular is often seen as a leisure activity rather than form of everyday transport, especially for the middle and the, the upper classes. Attitudes are very, very slowly changing. Um, but okay, apart from the negative, I also want to talk a bit about the positive. There are some examples that are at the forefront of um, non-motorized transport um, movements. And one example is um, Bogota, which has already created some uh, nearly 400 kilometers of segregated bicycle lanes. But that's, that's quite unique in developing countries. Um, Sao, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil are also developing quite large um, cycling networks. And then we have the case of China that used to be once cycling paradise at the height of um, the communist system. And then it sort of gave over its urban space to cars. And now it's trying once again to revive cycling. Um, and one type of intervention is um, bicycle sharing programs, which are becoming more and more popular in cities across China. But these also sometimes have drawbacks, like in the case of Shenzhen, that um, is shown in the picture here on the right hand side, the slide, um, where um, bicycles have been used, but then have been discarded, creating these, these eyesores and another environmental problem in the city. Okay, so in summary, I wish this had been a more cheerful presentation rather than um, listing all these all these problems and issues, but um, that's that's the reality. There is no point sugarcoating it. Most developing countries they will need this radical overhaul of urban transport to improve the situation. And in most cases, packages of measures are needed. Um, disconnected interventions simply will not have a big effect. The trends that we see in developing countries now are similar to those experienced earlier by Global North countries, but in the South, the problems are magnified because the South has many more mega cities and um, the lack of resources is also a problem. Generally, there is a high level of dissatisfaction over the devastation of cities caused by urban traffic, but most places have very weak local traditions of public of public action. And this is of course the legacy of poverty, corruption, or political totalitarian political systems or um, post-colonial type of context. So many of the cities that we covered in the book they do have high potential to overcome urban transport problems uh, because the cities are dense enough. Some of the cities, not all, but some have um, retained this very strong pedestrian culture. And they also have substantial portions of careless households that would have nothing to lose from um, car traffic restrictions. But in practice, um, there are all sorts of um, transport governance arrangements um, that inhibit more effective development. Okay, so that was that was it for, for my part and I'll be happy to, to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Briani. This has been uh, incredibly rich overview of uh, you know what the interventions are that you've seen to be the most high potential 
and uh, what the state of affairs is. Uh, with that, I would like to invite our participants to enter their questions into the Q&A window, um, and uh, we'll start diving in. I already see some, uh, some folks have already entered their questions. Um, let me just go through here. And while, uh, while you are answering your questions, I'll, I'm going to kick us off. Um, with uh, one question that came to mind for me when you were speaking around uh, the high potential of addressing environmental performance of existing fleets, uh, when you're talking about the technology-based solutions. Um, mm -hmm. do you, are you able to share some examples um, or something that you've seen in your research of successful approaches or uh, where, where that's been done effectively and what some of the consequent uh, interventions have been? Um, I would say that the two countries that appear to be at the forefront of technological innovation are China and India. Um, and one of their big advantages is that they have domestic car production, so they can produce their own electric vehicles at, at lower cost. So they don't need to borrow technology from the north. But then I've also I've also seen in my research on um, transport psychology and transport symbolism that often the, um, the middle classes and the, the higher income strata of those countries um, do not care so much about the symbolism of um, things like electric cars or hybrid cars, what, what are called in combination with our called eco cars, unless these are associated with luxury brands like Mercedes, Mercedes Benz or um, uh -huh. BMW, things, things like that. So a lot of middle class people they won't care to buy an electric Toyota if that if that doesn't add to the image of themselves and, and their families. Uh -huh. the Thank environmental you. Friendly, uh -huh. So the environmental right. friendliness of the technology itself doesn't have that strong symbolism yet in this context. Mm -hmm. And there is a big contrast with the global north where using an environmentally friendly vehicle does give you sort of positive social capital. Mm -hmm. So think about all the Toyota Prius drivers in the United States. If they're associated, you know, with a certain environmentally friendly lifestyle, and that's that's not happening yet in the south. Right, right. That makes good sense. Um, so we have a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, with ride sharing becoming more popular, uh, for example, Uber and spin offs, motorcycle taxis, and et cetera, do you think that road transportation can be a more sustainable option in developing markets? Um, road, road transportation is in car based transportation, you mean? I believe so. Um, no, I, I, here it says uh, that um, the, there's the example of motorcycle taxis. I, I believe. The question is is more uh, just noting that uh, vehicle-based transportation, um, not exclusively necessarily cars. Um, sure. I mean, in the case of motorcycles, we see the example of places like like Vietnam, where motorcycles are used quite a lot, but generally in South in Southeast Asia, and up until now, the conventional wisdom has been that we also need to try and restrict motorcycle traffic as much as possible, but now this new thinking has emerged that perhaps um, motorcycle-based traffic is a lot more desirable than previously thought because in a lot of ways that motorcycle ownership is considered sort of a stepping stone to car ownership. And then imagine what can happen if all those people that now use motorcycles suddenly switch to cars, it cause major congestion. So in some places now the focus is shifted to keeping people on motorcycles rather than have them shift to cars. Right. Interesting. So um, in terms of um, the 
buses, as what well, questions have come in here regarding um, your thoughts on what developing countries can do to better implement green urban transportation, in this case, the example of electric buses for mass transportation? Um, I think I think that's already happening. Actually, it's a question of turning over the existing fleet. But like I said, the countries that have a domestic production um, are hugely advantaged there because they can produce electric buses at a lower cost. Other countries will always be disadvantaged if they have to purchase um, those cleaner technologies from elsewhere. I mean, it's desirable, but um, but the the potential is limited because of the cost. So local manufacturing is inextricably linked at that yeah. capacity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, one of the notes that you raised uh, was regarding, you know, this, this incredible example of road-based public transport and um, the, the unconventional migration of innovation from south to north south of the BRT. Mm -hmm. um, are mm -hmm. you able to share some examples? Are there any examples of um, also collaboration between the global south and north in addressing some of these issues um, given that uh, they, they are so rapidly evolving and there, there's so much learning to, to be shared across uh, the, the barrier. Well, sure. I mean, collaborations go on, go on all the time. It's not a question of individual examples. This is, um, I mean, we live in a, in a connected world now, so policy diffusion is constantly happening. Um, the question is translating policies keeping in mind the local culture and psychology. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all the focus now. I was talking before about the different symbolism that's attached to different technologies in the north and in the south. That's the kind of thing that takes a while to change. You can easily transfer the technology, but mm -hmm. um, if a culture is not poised to accept it, then it's not going to work. That's that's really the main issue, and uh, the technology itself. That that's probably the easier part. Transferring the technology, changing culture and mentality. That that's a process. Right. I believe that in our own research, we've seen that, uh, for example, not and we're talking about non-motorized transport, and particularly in East Africa. Um, walking, which is still a predominant mode of transportation in many African countries, is still perceived as a sign of poverty. Um, so it's, it's absolutely kind of, uh, to me, resonating when, you, when you're speaking about that behavior change and perception being so critical and the investment and awareness campaigns being an essential element of this work. Um, so with respect uh, to some of the things we've seen, are, are there any really disruptive uh, solutions that you've seen that may have uh, addressed some of these issues in a way that surprised you in, in doing this work? Um, disruptive solutions. I would say DRT has been the major innovation in recent uh -huh. years, perhaps Bicycle sharing, smartphone-based bicycle sharing has also been, um, well, disruptive to some extent and only for, for certain countries like like China, not, not everywhere. And then the major disruptive technology we expect now is um, automated driving, of course, but I mm -hmm. say it's too early to speculate about its effects in the north even and then um, probably take a little bit longer even to, to be applied to the south. But mm -hmm. I wanted to make another point when you're talking about, um, about walking being associated with, with poverty in Africa and in other, in other um, parts of the global south. Um, I wanted to say that if one is located in the global north in cooler climates, it's, um, it's easy to forget that a lot of cities in the south, they can have this very hot and humid climate. So 
So mm -hmm. the same technologies or behaviors that might work quite well in the north, they might not work just as well in the south. So what we see in a lot of um, Southeast Asia, for example, places that are in the tropical uh, climate band, um, because because it's so hot and humid outside, anybody who has achieved some level of economic success in life wants immediately to get out of the street and get into air conditioning and private yeah. <laughs> private motorization and air conditioning. So that's why we see this sort of urbanism that's dominated by air conditioned cars, air conditioned shopping malls with people's um with economic needs they try to spend as little as little time as they can outdoors. And if one is based in places like the Netherlands, the bicycle kingdom, right. uh, it's it's easy to forget these climatic factors. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a fantastic point. And we have a few more questions that have come in that are really interesting. Um, so uh, uh, one question here is, is there any evidence that investment in technologies like internet bandwidth lead to long-term changes in traffic patterns and the demand for the most congested parts of the cities? Essentially, does telecommuting and virtualization provide some hope for the future? Um. I don't think that's personally. I don't think that um, that's really the solution. And the reality is that are there are already many countries in the south now that have quite good internet connections in the major in the major cities. But the impact on traffic of those technologies has not has not been all that great. In fact, some cities in the south probably have better internet connection than um, what we have here in Australia. <laughs> I'm struggling. <laughs> at the moment connecting um to the webinar. But yeah, no, I don't think I don't think the impact on traffic has been has been great. Is it fair to speculate that perhaps uh, coming back to your point about culture, uh in terms of work like culture and expectation to be on site might have something to play with it. Again, I'm playing completely speculation here, a little bit of up couch uh research here. Yes. Um so two things going on. One, like you said, um, different work cultures in the north and in the south. So let's not forget that a lot of the south still operates under these, um, I don't want to say totalitarian, but perhaps authoritarian type of cultures. So then workplace culture is not as flexible as in the north telecommuting is not, is not as acceptable. Uh, people, yes, are expected. To, to be on site, and then hierarchies tend to be much stronger in the workplace, where um, which means that employees kind of have to defer to their supervisors, be on, expected to be on time, um, and be be there physically, physically be there. So that's that's one issue. Another issue which I mentioned earlier is that a lot of countries, in a lot of countries, the authorization is still increasing, so people are still purchasing cars. So whatever effects we see that might be due to technology, whatever positive effects, they're offset by increasing motorization at this point. So we're not in a um, equilibrium kind of state just yet. It's not Absolutely. like in the United States where there is already a saturated market with cars and then we can measure the different effects. So technology or other interventions. Here we there are these two opposing forces at play. Of course. Mm -hmm. I suppose uh, time will tell how these uh, dynamics shift and, and influence one another. It's very exciting. Um, so are, are there any questions? Oh, there's actually some questions coming in through chat uh, or maybe some comments. Um, uh, if telecom companies are successful in the global south, why is it that transportation is lacking behind in the global south? Could you repeat this last question, please? 
Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to der uh, derive this. This is a question I'm seeing in the chat just for your reference as well, Dr. Briani. If telecom companies are successful in the global south, south, why is it that transportation is lacking behind in the global south? So it's uh, quite a broad question. Yes, yes. Well, so I think um, I think one big issue is um, the political system of the global south. So what we see is um, these two these two uh, interlocking loops or vicious circles. Um, one that sees cars as a necessity and the other one that sees cars as a status symbol. And both of these loops, I believe, um, stem from the embrace of neoliberalism as the governing principle. So um, that means that either um, governments in the, in the South are weak, or in some cases, um, previously strong governments um, have now retreated. And now this is, of course, compounded by things like corruption and dysfunctional post-colonial legacies and then authoritarianism. But so what happens on one side, one side of the loop works like this. So you have this neoliberal governance system. Um, and then this leads to reduced investment in alternative forms of transport, public transport, cycling, walking. Um, and then right after that, individual um, types of transport like cars or private transport solutions like shuttle buses to one's employment place provided by the employer. These are encouraged, so not things that are government-based like public transport for all. Um, then once this happens, car ownership becomes necessary to, to just get around efficiently in the city. And once uh -huh. car ownership is seen as necessity in life, then the government rushes to accommodate uh -huh. the needs of the car growing elite, and this leads to further reductions in the quality of public transport and cycling infrastructure. So that's one side of the loop. Then we have the status, kind of so the psychological component. You have a neoliberal government, and um, it means that um, society becomes more unequal socially and financially. And then we know from, from research economic research says in societies that are more unequal, the display of status becomes more important. So you need to clearly show by through what you own where you stand in society. So the car you you own, the car you drive, needs to place uh -huh. you right away in the social hierarchy. And then this becomes a status symbol, of course. And once cars are a status symbol, then you've got this government that rush to accommodate the needs of the our owning elite, like I said, and mm -hmm. this leads to further inequality. So there are these two loops at play that are difficult to break. And I don't think technology itself has the power to, to break this loop. It's more of a governance issue than a technological issue. I think technological optimism is perhaps one more entity in this case. It's, uh, you raise a tremendously good point, and thank you so much for connecting the dots across that entire, those entire loops. It's, it's fascinating and enlightening, and um, I'm hopeful, uh, again, to not to end on a pessimistic note, but uh, uh, for all of our attendees and all of the folks that will listen to this webinar, um, uh, and the recording, and I do apologize, we're coming to time, so that was the last question, uh, but um, there are other questions coming in. Uh, please feel free to contact Dr. Biani via her email address and or uh, to webinars at engineeringforchange.org. But uh, what is uh, promising is that hopefully our listeners will now be uh, thinking holistically about solutions and how policy and uh, perception behavior will play into the overall betterment of uh, our transportation um, quandaries that we are facing globally. Um, with this, 
I, I would really like to thank Dr. Poyani for, for taking the time to spend with us today, for, for sharing uh, her insights, and to encourage all of you to pick up a copy of her book. Um, this was just the tip of the iceberg of, of, from all the exciting and interesting insights in, inside. I'd like to thank you all for attending, um, joining us on today's webinar. There will be a recording of this webinar available. Uh, for those of you uh, who are registered, you will receive a notification of that recording when it's ready. For those of you seeking professional development hours, the code is listed on our slide here. Please uh, send us an email to request that, um, that uh, professional development hour. And again, if we did not address your questions, email us at the webinars at engineeringforchange.org. With that, I, I'd like to wish you all a good evening or a good morning, depending where you are. I encourage you all to join us as E4C members to get information about upcoming webinars. And we hope to see you on our next one next month. Take care.